Okay, so it's recording. Let me just uh, share the screen to the calendar. Okay, so today, as I said, we're covering the two topics of reinforcement learning and hidden Markov models. Uh, reinforcement learning, we're only going to cover in a more of a lecture type uh, discussion, as this is too too involved of a topic. Uh, and then HMMs, I will cover with. I have some code. So it's already on my GitHub, so we'll take a look at that. I have provided a book chapter here, so that is a, a very complete, basically, uh, I, there's actually two chapters in here. You can skip chapter eight. Uh, that's for the next class if you take the deep learning course. But um, if you want to learn more about reinforcement learning on your own beyond, I'll go over this today, but uh, if you want to read through it, you can read this chapter nine I provided. And it talks about how reinforcement learning works. And it talks about the code as well. So we'll talk about this um, today. Also, uh, if, you, if you have time tomorrow, uh, Tuesday at 10 AM, one of my students is uh, doing his uh, master defense. And his topic is on reinforcement learning as it applies to like aviation uh, stabilization. So if you're interested in that, uh, see that you I, it's open to the public so you can attend between like 10 to 11 a.m okay just be there on time sorry no it's not in my office it's, it's, it's a good question right it's in anderson 247 it's a conference room so it's open to the public and you can attend if you have an interest if you have an interest for instance here you know if you're in our, our college and you want to do um, a master's right with a thesis you know, it wouldn't hurt you to just see the, the process and how that works. Second, if you have an interest in reinforcement learning, you'll learn a lot from him. David Richter, he's pretty good. Uh, and then if you want to learn how he applied it to his project and everything. And I'll talk a little bit about it today to motivate it. But I should say, you know, you're, you're invited if you would like to attend from 10 to 11 as it is open to the public. All right. So um, these are the topics. I'll kind of just motivate a little bit today uh, before we get into the into how it works. So these are two areas of machine learning which are different from supervised and unsupervised learning. So if you remember, basically we said at the beginning of the semester that we could divide machine learning into uh, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning, right? And so that's basically, uh, we've covered supervised learning a lot this semester. And then unsupervised learning, which, you know, most of this, right? And then if you remember this video and, you know, these video, this one in particular was unsupervised learning, right? So we talked about how when you don't have labels, what do you do? So the other technique is reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning has something to do with hidden Markov models, right? So the original concept of the automaton, right? And, you know, where you have a state machine and it's a machine that goes from state to state to state to state, right? And then you start adding things to it and then you go into the direction of either hidden Markov models or uh, reinforcement learning basically. So if we, if we switch over to the whiteboard, Okay, so you guys can see the whiteboard here. We basically end up with a new type of machine learning algorithm, a new technique. And what's important about this is that this is actually different from supervised and unsupervised learning. Okay, so let me just get this. All right, so basically, you, let's, let's think about what we have, supervised learning. Right, and then we have the 
we have unsupervised. Right, and we've covered both of these. And then okay. now we're talking about this idea of reinforcement learning, right? So supervised learning, how does that work? So basically in supervised learning, we have a feature vector, right? F1, F2, F3, and then we're gonna predict some kind of a label, right? And to train the model, we must have vectors and labels. So we must have this data available, okay? With unsupervised, we still have the vectors, F1, F2, F3, Fn, but there is no label. So instead, as I showed you guys, we have to create these groupings, right? We say, I want three groups or five groups, and then the labels become uh, those groupings, basically. So that's why we did an example where we actually were able to get labels, you know, zero and one, if you remember for the sports versus data science sentence. But if you think about this, this is all happening. There's an element of time here, basically, in a sense. So here we take an instance, a sentence or whatever it is, and we predict something based on, let's say time T. Do you see that? At time T, time, whatever it is, time. But now, so we could say, for instance, we could write this as, as saying, uh, you know, let's say, uh, information at time t, okay? However, not all problems are like this. There are other kinds of problems, right? And these are basically called sequential problems. Sequential problems, you see that? What is a sequential problem? It's a problem that in, in a sense, if, if we wanna use the same analogy, Right, and we're gonna we're gonna do something, infer something. So here we have i at time t, i at time t minus one, i at time t minus two. Do you see that? So now this information is relevant to predict. So that what that this could be anything, by the way, and this could. So let's say this is f one, f two to F5, right? And this is F1, and these are different features, but what matters is the number here. Now, keep in mind, we could encode this as just being one big vector of size 15. And so that brings it to just considering it time T, right? We could do that. But in this case, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is actually considering sequence. So that means that these are separate entities, okay? These are separate entities that affect the, the outcome. That is to say, we start here, we go to here, we go to there, and based on that, we infer whatever this is. Do you see that? What's an example of that? Well, an example of that is, for instance, in, in text, right? We know this, the cat is, uh, sleeping on the what? Moon? Mars? Fire? Not every word goes in here, correct? But something like bed, pillow, floor, windowsill, those make sense. Do you guys see that? So you guys are able, by looking at this, sequence has to happen like this, right? If the sequence is, is important. If I said the sleeping is on the cat, that's different, right? It's not perfect, but there's some meaning there. The order does matter with those same, that same sequence of words. You guys see that? So this is really important, all right? And so really, honestly, we, we usually divide machine learning into supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Another classification I think that's probably better is supervised, unsupervised, and sequential methods.
okay? Because of these sequential methods, which these are, by the way, related, they're not, it's, they're not unrelated, but distinctively, we have a couple of techniques which are hidden Markov models and reinforcement. They're a little bit different, but they're related. Sequential is more, you, you look at all the information kind of all at once, although, you know, in, in, a, in a time sequence, if you will. Reinforcement learning is more about taking a step. So in, in the analogy here with reinforcement learning is you do this, and when you do that, you evaluate the context and the environment, update your parameters, go to the next one, get some information about the environment, new observations, sometimes some what is called a reward and policy, and, and then you keep going. Do you see that, guys? So, so those are basically examples. So for instance, reinforcement learning can be used for like self-driving cars. So any, anything, automation of vehicles, right? That's why I said I, I will show some videos today. Um, now those videos are probably programmed, but reinforcement learning applies to them. And then hidden Markov models are basically also sequential, but they're applied extensively to something like this predicting you know, the, the next word in the sequence, uh, predicting also uh, certain states. So for instance, we'll do an example today where you wanna predict the weather based on somebody's mood, right? So if you, you can't, you, you don't live in that town, right? So you can't really say what it's going on in that town. And you don't wanna ask your friend directly what the weather is like, but you can say, hey, how are you feeling today? Are you sad or happy? Next day, are you sad or happy? And based on that, you're able to infer, okay, well, usually when my friend is sad, it's raining. When my friend is happy, it's sunny. And so you're gonna look at that sequence of, 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 of those states over five days and be able to predict the weather over those five days. Do you guys see that? That's a hidden mark of model. And the solution to that problem is based on an algorithm called the Viterbi algorithm. How many of you have heard of the Viterbi algorithm? When you studied maybe dynamic programming, there's a person that who invented that, Viterbi. The algorithm is so significant that they named an entire school somewhere out east, you know, in his name. So anyway, um, but, but anyway, yeah, so, this is basically what we're doing today, the, the classification of this, okay? All right, so we've covered then, as I said, supervised, unsupervised. Today, we're just looking at sequential. So these are, this is a very interesting area of research um, that can be applied. You know, it's definitely what they're using for one of the tools that they're using. Obviously, image processing is also used. But this algorithm allows you to um, basically program, you know, objects that move, right, that move in an environment. And then they need to basically assess every step, you know, what do I do now, you know? Because, you know, imagine a rover on Mars, right? A rover on Mars, there's a delay of like eight minutes or more. I don't know exactly. Of, of, of the trans, so it's probably 16 minutes, right? 30 minutes for a bit back and forth, right? So imagine one way is 30 minutes. Yeah, so it takes a while, right? And so think about it. If you tell the rover, hey, rover, advance a foot, you, you can't really know what the rover did until like, you know, after the delay. So really it helps that the rover, when it does something, it can evaluate what it did and then decide, okay, maybe I should go back or I'm, um, cause it, maybe it tilts. You don't want to tilt too much cause it might flip over things like that. So, so that's just one application. I mean, there's many self-drive, the Teslas that self-drive, they, I don't know what algorithms they're using exactly, but at least they've tried reinforcement learning to see if it works or not. All right, so, so that's basically the idea with sequential. So before we get into like, the algorithms, and I'll start with HMMs just because HMMs should be a little bit simpler <laughs> and then from there build up to reinforcement learning. But, but right now I really just wanna motivate some of this. So let me just look up, I have 
some videos that I want you guys to look at. All right, so we are going to Right, so the project that might, you know, that if you wanna to attend tomorrow's presentation, as I said, uh, the, the project that uh, David Richter developed is called QPlan, right? So it's a toolkit any of you could use uh, for reinforcement learning and, and aviation. It works with two flight simulators, JSB Sim and X-Plane 11. Doesn't incorporate Microsoft yet because it just came out and we just didn't have time for that. But if Microsoft permits, if it works like x 11, it could be added as well. And um, so basically the idea of this is that uh, you can do anything, but we only worked on the problem of attitude control. So attitude control just means we grab the plane, flip, put it in an awkward position, the plane stabilizes. And there's obviously PIDs and everything, other tools that are used for stabilization, but we just, our question is how, how does reinforcement learning do with it. Okay, another thing is, I, as I was talking, one of the things we can, although we have it on simulators, you can easily build, you know, with this material, uh, styrofoam. This also works for like, you know, these kinds of little robots. It's all Python, uh, but you can build one of these very inexpensively for like $30 minus the electronics, which they're not that expensive. And the th actually, the thing that's expensive is the radio controller. And so you can literally, as long as you can control it with your laptop, you'd be able to take it up in the air. Yes, sir. For this plane, it doesn't, you don't need a microcontroller. All you need is everything, all the intelligence would happen on your laptop. The thing that you need is, as, as we were talking, a radio transmitter that, let me share this. I don't think I'm unfortunate with it. Yeah, so what you would need is a radio transmitter that's strong enough to send the commands from the laptop to the aircraft. All the aircraft needs is a little tiny radio receiver, right? Which is basically, you know, just something with like 10 pins. So every pin you're sending a command and the pin just sends to, to little stepper motors that will control like the, the control surfaces like ailerons, rudder, and all of that. So that's all you need. You don't need a computer on the plane. You just need the transmitter to, to tell it which pins should be turned on to control the, the stepper motors. You guys see that? So really, the, in essence, the RC plane doesn't change. You can, the same plane that you would use with an RC controller, you can use with this. What's key is you need to sync the radio transmitter from your laptop to that receiver on the plane. That's it. So there's no added weight. Obviously, there's a range, there are range issues, things like that. But the intelligence is at, at this point is, um, yeah. So, so that's the general idea. The, then you can add a few other things to send information back. Um, you know, of the states of the plane, right? So that's the only condition that you definitely do need to, to address, but it should be there's, um, there's, a, there's a, like gyroscopes and things like that that you can have on the plane that send some information about the position of the plane, et cetera. 
But there, but my point is, these are all already things that you would have on an RC plane anyway if you wanted to. So there should be no added. Does that make sense? Yeah. But anyway, so so that's kind of where you can take this. So you know, it does need a little bit of thinking about. David's project is mainly focused on the simulators, right, and getting information. And it, it the actually the the plane that we use in the simulator is actually a you know, like a real plane, you know, Cessna 172. Uh, so you can see it here. But that's basically the, the idea there. That's the plane, right, in midair. You can see right now that the al this is the algorithm running. And this is an older version, actually. I, I couldn't find one of David's better videos, but you can see the plane is actually, see how it goes from one side to the other. And then as it, as it starts to go, the, the wing is starts to go down, see it corrects and it starts to go back. And this is during the training process. This is not actually when it's finalized in the training process. When it finalizes in the training process, it's a little bit more stable. Do you guys see that? And so basically that's what reinforcement learning can be used for. It can be used to, in this case, to stabilize the plane by controlling the, the, the surface. But there's a lot that goes into getting this algorithm to work, right? In theory, this could also work for traveling from A to B, or maybe even for descending and, and landing and things like that. Okay, so, mo so all the work has been done in simulators, but as I said, obviously, this could be done. Um, this could be done on even physical hardware, as it is not that expensive to build us the airframe. What's expensive, maybe or co more complicated, I should say, is the the electronics that go inside of it. But you know, anybody that's creative, I'm sure, can figure it out. So that's one of the things, uh, one of the motivations. Um, so, you know, as you know, the, that's why we talked about ADSB, as you guys know, um, you know, that, that's kind of where that's going. That can descend down to drones also, uh, self-driving cars, you know, you know, little robots like this one, um, you know, et cetera. So there's a lot going on. I saw recently, if I can find it, a video. Let me just see here. So I saw this the other day, which I thought was pretty impressive. And you can see how this is actually agriculture, or maybe it's not this one. No, it is. See the, see how, I think it was this one. Yeah, there it is. So basically, the hardware is already there, right? And it's really just about adding the intelligence to these things. But see this device, you know, you map a grid and this doesn't even need reinforcement learning. This is just like path, uh, path planning, but you can, you can extend this work to um, have intelligence. So notice how they're being used now for, I guess, spraying fertilizer, seeds, et cetera. So, for, so I know some of you were working in agriculture. So certainly this is pretty interesting and pretty solid, um, solid platform. Huh? Oh yeah? You have some stock in this? 
<laughs> you should. <laughs> All right. So this is uh, pretty impressive because there's a lot of agriculture, right? And labor is the big, you know, human labor is, is a high cost. So certainly this is pretty good. Uh, anyway, so there's a lot of things and I, I don't need to show you Teslas or anything like that, you know. So my point is all, all the platforms are there, right? All the platforms are there. So basically what you really need, the problem is you need a simulator. You can't have a Q learning algorithm learning on this, okay? Why? Because it's at the beginning when it's learning, it's very random. It's gonna crash all the time and it's gonna cost you too much money. So then obviously the problem is Whatever you're doing, let's say this as an example, this agriculture, you have to create a simulator, you know, with the physics. Then you have to go in there and in the simulator train, right? Train the, train the, um, as you saw in, in my simulator, right? So you saw the plane a second ago, you, you train the agent in that simulator. And then after that, that model, you just extend to the physical device. Got it? Isn't that basically it? Yeah. For, the, for what? For which one? For David's project, we actually used two simulators. So we used uh, a, something called JSB Sim and then another one called X Plane 11. So X Plane 11 is like the, used to be the standard. Uh, now there's Microsoft uh, 2000, so obvious or whatever the number is, Microsoft's new software. So, but yeah, we built two simulators because X Plane 11 does not allow you to, to speed up the physics. So basically, you're training in real time. But with JSB Sim, you can step up the physics. So one second of flight in the simulator is not a second of, you know, it, it's faster than a second of flight in real time. The advantage of that is you can train faster. You see that? And so JSB Sim was used for that, for the training, X-Plane 11, if you will, for the testing. But it also helps to, because it generalizes, right? They're two separate flight simulators. The model works on both. So technically on a real setting, it, well, obviously in a real setting, we'll have wind and other problems. So, but that's, those are the general, issues that you have to deal with. That's why a good simulator is really important. All right, so this is the, the, this is the motivation, All right? So as I said, the idea was to kind of give you a sense of, of what you can apply this to. So hopefully you understand that, you know, we don't want to just do stuff in simulators, right? We want to have actual applications, either self-driving cars, drones for agriculture, package delivery, rovers, satellites, whatever it is, right? There's all this hardware or airplanes like a Cessna 172. Key thing is you have to train it in a simulator, right? And then you have basically, so now we can switch over to the whiteboard. All right, so we're gonna switch over. So now that, you know, motivation is complete, uh, we can switch over to the whiteboard and so basically the idea is, you know, we want something real, some device. We have some agent and that's the terminology of the algorithm. So the agent is the program, you know, that would use something sequential, right? A very simple thing would be like HMMs. A much more powerful thing would be like reinforcement learning, All right? And so the agent needs to be able to predict what to do in sequence for this device, right? So let's say the, the, the drone needs to go here and then it needs to go there and then for whatever reason, go back and then continue you know, in a path. So path planning in a sense. So obviously you can model these things to states, right, in, in some fashion. And so the agent needs to learn to traverse state, okay? So an HMM initially, a markup chain, is for that, for traversing through nodes, which are states in some kind of organized fashion. Reinforcement learning will add elements, more important elements like, okay, once I take, go to a new state, was that a good move or, you know, I took some action, was that a good action or a bad action? So that, that brings in this idea of rewards and so on, all right? So it brings in 
more elements to make a more powerful uh, idea. So these are all uh, sequential things. So the agent then, before it can, uh, you know, you can't just train on the real element because obviously it's expensive. So you need some kind of a simulator. And there's a lot of simulators out there. Um, you know, Real Engine, for instance, Real, I don't know if you guys have heard of Real Engine, but it's basically created to develop uh, video games, that kind of thing. It's just the engine so that you don't have to do focus too much on the coding building from scratch. It's being used quite extensively by people who want to simulate the, their thing. So for instance, let's say you're a Ford Motor Company and you have self-driving cars as well. You need a sim, go to Real Engine, hire some people, obviously, build your sim for your specific goals. You know, having people walk on the street so the cars don't hit them, those kinds of things. Got it? So you need to develop some kind, and there's a lot of sims for aviation. As you can see, we found uh, JSB sim, X-Plane. So, but you can also, my, my point is you can customize these uh, sims, okay? And so basically, uh, then you have the physics of the simulator, and then you have the agent. So you end up with, you know, basically like two things, right? You can think of it as you have one program, which is the reinforcement learning age element or program, and then you have one that's the simulator. They're totally independent. So they need to communicate in some way, right? And usually the best way to communicate is like through the network, via packets. Uh, via the protocol called UDP, so UDP packets. So if you're familiar with a little bit of networking and you've heard about UDPs, you probably already automatically understand what this means, okay? So they're just communicating. They're basically servers, right? And, you know, the, the reinforcement learning agent needs some kind of a protocol to communicate with the SIM via UDP. The, U, the SIM then does something, and then it sends some information back. And this is going to update the state. So for instance, let's think now specifically of the airplane, right? So the airplane that we're trying to fly. So to fly an airplane, um, I'm going to, you know, what do you need? You know, an airplane looks like, like that. And then there's some kind of power there. And then there's the pedals, right? So you, these are basically the what the pilot would interact with, like the steering wheel of a car, right? So these controls. So these controls need to be commands that are going to be sent by the reinforcement learning agent to the sim. Do you guys see that? And then what does the, pi the pilot need? So the pilot usually then, let's imagine, obviously the pilot would look out the window. However, in our program, we did not include or incorporate images. So the kind of the idea is we're flying in the clouds, right? So you can't really fly through visual, then what do you do? You fly through these things called the, I don't know, the indicators. They provide the information for a pilot flying in the clouds. Instruments, do you guys see that? And so the instrument information is also controlled by the SIM. SIM sends it back to the reinforcement learning engine. That's it. That's all the communication that should happen, right? So, the, so basically, this is like the pilot when it sends something, it's controlling these, you know, these things, right? The, the power or the, you know, the yoke that is called or, or the pedals or something like that. And that moves the plane. When the pilot wants information, he'll get the information that he would, or he or she will get the information that they would get from the indicators. And that is sent back to the reinforcement learning agent. So that's the all, all the communication that needs to happen. So basically then the agent here needs to control the plane based on what it receives from here. So it'll get that information, which is called a new observation. And then with that information, the, the algorithm is updated. It'll send new commands, right? And then the sim will send new observations and so on. As this is happening back and forth really fast, the algorithm here needs to tell it also, okay, the things that you're doing are good or bad because it evaluates these, right? So, it, so you need to know something about this here, right? You need to basically, and that's usually called the reward function. The reward function is the thing, the policy 
that tells you if you're doing good or bad. Because you could just randomly send uh, inputs into these, right? You could randomly do that. But you don't want to randomly do that because you're going to crash. You want to do them in some kind of order. So you send those to the plane. The plane sends you back information about how it's doing and it's in, in, in the problem in, in turn here. So here we want attitude control. We want the plane to be stable. If we were trying to descend the land, that's a different, much more complex problem, right? Because you, you could crash or something like that. Now we don't use images, but as it turns out, it is not difficult. And it's actually well studied how to do images. It's a little bit like supervised learning, like what we learn in the course this semester. Take some pictures, right? Maybe take some sequential pictures. So for, what that means is take a picture now, a picture a second from now, a picture, well, maybe, you know, fractions of a second, right? But take four or five of those so that you have a, a, a type of a video that you see some kind of change that's going on. And then those become the inputs you know, feature vectors to the model as part of the observation space. Do you see that? So we'll, we'll see that in a second, but right now I'm just kind of trying to give a high level motivation. Is this clear guys? And that's basically how it works. I mean, obviously there's some kind of algorithm in here based on reinforcement learning, all that nice, those nice things. We'll get into that uh, discussion, but right now this is how this would work. Really, the hardest thing is the reward function. It's difficult because there's, you know, it's not easy to craft a reward function. Imagine, let's say that I want to teach a robot how to how to dance, you know, salsa, right? That, what, you know, what what is a good salsa move? You know what I'm talking? About? It's very difficult, and sometimes crafting those can be very tough but there's even tools for that. And you can apply neural nets even to infer the reward function, it's possible. All right, so anyway, so that's kind of the high level motivation. Does that make sense? All right, and we will come back to this. However, before we get to reward, uh, sorry, to reinforcement learning, we're, we'll look at the easier problem in sequence computing of, and I hope I'm in the right place. Yeah, we'll look at um, the easier problem of, so like I said, with sequential methods, so with sequential methods, you can have uh, hidden Markov models and you can have reinforcement, reinforcement models. So where do these come from? They, they both kind of come from this idea of the automaton. Which if, you know, when you took some kind of computing course, hopefully that was, a, a, you know, basically the, the first introduction, right? So what is that? It's a, it's a modeling of sequence. So an automaton just means something like that, right? So where we identify that these are states, right? And then these are movements from one state to the other. Right, until you, you maybe start at a beginning state and then you have an ending state. Do you see that? And that's the underlying starting point for both hidden Markov models and also for reinforcement learning. So for instance, you know, I'll give you an example. Let's model an entire language with just an automaton like this. So what's the classic example? the sheep language. What is the sheep language? Right? 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 Bah. Right? <laughs> so that's the sheep language, right? So how do we model that one? Well, if we wanna do an automaton for this, we start at, you know, the starting point, right? And then we have E, but this E actually can be like this, right? Because we can have multiple states of E, and then we can go to H, and H can also be 
like that until you have an end, let's say an ending state. You see that? So that's what we're talking about. So it actually turns out that anything that you can model, you know, you can start with some problem like this, you know, this one's pretty straightforward to understand, bad, right? And that gives you the, uh, the sheep language, but you can model it with an automaton and then you can just produce whatever you want once you've defined this structure. Do you guys see that? All right, so another, so, so that, you know, given that we have that idea, oops, given that we have that idea that brings us into hidden Markov models, which are ways of predicting information, right? So we have now ways of, of predicting, for instance, let's say the cat, oops. Eats dot, dot, dot. So let's say that for this, we want to assign the part of speech tags. Part of speech tags for what is for the, what is it? It's a determiner, right? So DT. And this could be a noun, but you know it, but not necessarily, right? Maybe for whatever reason, it's an adjective, right? The blue cat, the tabby cat, something like that. Do you guys see that? And so you have to basically, and then this could be a verb or it could be a noun or it could be something else. So we've got to figure out here, given this, okay, the, that's the state. Uh, and then, let's say, Tabby. Cat sleeps. Let me just make sure this is. Yeah, so the tabby cat sleeps. So then you would say, so these are the states for that, right? And then something like that. So we basically, once again, can model this if we're, but remember that the output here is that given, so now basically we can start writing this as a probability, a conditional probability that given the tabby cat dot, 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 we infer DT noun verb. Do you guys see that? So that's what we're trying to do. But the problem is there are, po there are potential other ones, right? So there is also DT, I did noun verb. That's actually not the right one. There's adjective noun given the tabby cat. Do you guys see that? So basically here, we end up with multiple probabilities. And we have to pick which one, the most likely one, right? So usually this translates into the highest probability. So let's say for instance, that the probability of the tabby cat being DT noun verb is you know, 0 0.003. The probability of the tabby cat being DT adjective noun is 0 0.0. 0, 08. Do you see that? So which one do you pick? The highest probability. Does this make sense? So that's basically what we do here in this type of problem in hidden Markov models. Okay. Our, this could translate, for instance, in you know, the plane has these states, right? Uh, you know, left, left, left. You know, that's probably not good, right? So then what you would want to do as actions is turn right, right, right. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's doing something like that. It's similar concept. Got it, guys? So here in this example, though, this is not reinforcement learning. This is only hidden Markov models, okay? So as it turns out, this type of conditional probability is a tough one uh, to solve, right? But we use Bayes' theorem to simplify things, right? So we're gonna use Bayes' theorem. And that's just, you know, the, the same thing that is used in naive Bayes and in, in lots of places. 
you end up using Bayes' theorem. And basically, I'm not going to get into all the details of Bayes' theorem here, um, but just to say that we need to end up with, you know, uh, a conditional probability that looks like probability of y given x times the probability of x, if I remember correctly, right? So we need to basically come up with a simplification of Bayes' theorem. So if I look at it, So, right, and then divided by PY. This because we, now one key thing, so, so basically we were kind of saying we would use this equation on all probability estimations, but if you look, PY will always be the same for all of them, right? And so you can basically cancel out PY and so we just end up with the probability of y given x times p of x. Okay, and so now we just have to determine what these represent, okay, in our model. So another simplification that we're going to do here is that instead of taking a probability of the whole sequence, you know, x1, x2, x3, we're going to break it up into individual probabilities. P of X1, P of X2, dot, 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 P of X, N. That simplifies, it, simplifies this problem a lot because now we can look at things independently as well. All right, so anyway, what's important here is we need to be able to calculate then, uh, you know, these probabilities for every single problem. So if we look at the previous one here, now we need to convert these and these, right, into those probabilities and then, you know, basically pick the highest value. Okay. So the best way to understand this will be with a little problem. Okay, so we're going to look at a little problem that should um, help us to understand this a little bit better. All right, so we're gonna take the following example. Right, so let's imagine that we have the following. We have states which are rainy, comma, sunny. Okay, so these are our two states. Okay, and then we have observations. And these are going to be walk, shop, clean, and walk. So what that basically means is that we have actually three types of observations, right? Three types of observations, which are walk, shop and clean. But we observed these three, these four things. So our goal then is to infer something about that, right? And there's a relationship here. So basically we wanna say, if I walk and shop, so this, this also, we have to make some assumptions that on Monday you walk, on Tuesday you shop, 
on Wednesday you clean and on Thursday you walk again, right? So based on that information, now you want to predict a new sequence. What would that sequence be? Was it rainy or sunny? You guys see this? Guys, is this making sense? So here then, what is the most likely thing that you that is happening to the weather on a day that you walk? Sunny, right? Sunny. What about shop? Eh, right, you because you're kind of indoor, you could be in a mall or something. So it could be that, but at the end of the day, that's going to depend on the behavior of people. So there's an assumption here of what do people do? So then I take all of you, right? And I basically uh, track you for a year with your Fitbits or whatever, right? And then you, you know, then I can tell, you know, it was raining and you were shopping or it was sunny and you were walking and and then I do that over a year and then what do I do I take statistics probabilities right and I'm able to infer a model a sequential model that I can use for predictive purposes does this make sense okay so again if you think about it so let me just finish this one sunny let's say this one is actually rainy clean what do you do when you know, what, what's the weather like if you're cleaning? Rain, right? You're not going to waste a good day. And then sunny, again, you walk. You see that? So this is what we're trying to do. If you think about it, this is very similar to the previous problem. In the previous problem, we were given the tabby cat and we predict the part of speech tags, right? And in this one, same thing probability of, you know, rainy, sunny, well, I got it backwards, but rainy, and then for walk, shop, clean, walk. Do you see that? It's the same concept. You're just modeling it different. And again, you calculate multiple probabilities. So another one, obviously this one's wrong, right? So one correct one is actually sunny, rainy, rainy, sunny given that. Does this make sense? So you have to calculate these probabilities. Again, the model that we use gives us, let's say 0 0.003. The correct one is this one, let's say. So then that one should be 0 0.007. That's the highest probability that we pick. We don't pick the other one because it's a lower probability. How do we determine this? we need to have individual probabilities. Do you see that? We need to have probabilities about, if you're sunny, what are you more likely, what is the most likely state to follow sunny? Is it rainy or sunny? What would you say? Based on, you already have some statistics in your brain, right? So if I ask you guys, if today is sunny, what's the most likely thing for tomorrow? Is it going to be sunny? Huh? Sure, right? It's, it's a little bit more likely. A simpler example here, to keep this simple, I only have two states. But let's imagine we have three states, actually. We have sunny, cloudy, and rainy. So if I say sunny and the next state is cloudy, What's the next, the third state? Would it be, what's the most likely one? Sunny, cloudy, or rainy on the third one? What would you say? Rainy or cloudy, right? And then possibly sunny, less likely. Because we see clouds, it's going to rain, right? So, I mean, you know, does this make sense, guys? So, so the whole point here is, although we started with part of speech tags, right, like this, and calculating these probabilities, it turns out that we can actually simplify this, or act, sorry, not simplify, but adapt this to any kind of problem. All right, so here I have the problem of the weather, okay? So we have the problem of the weather, and our goal is really to compute this, okay? So what do we need for this, right? So what do we need for this problem? So let's think about, about that now, because I'm talking to you about these probabilities, and I kind of gave you this whole 
thing about Bayes' theorem, right? So we talked about Bayes' theorem here, and you can say, you simplify it. You can see here now, what's important here is why are these, let's say, and X are these, right? So you need information about the individual X's. You know, what's the probability of tabby in the vocabulary? What's the probability of the? The is the most frequent word, so has a high probability. But also of DT given the. So that is to say, if I give you a the, what's the probability that it's a determiner versus a noun versus a verb? Do you guys see that? So there's this probability of being in a state and going into another state. And then there's this probability of being in a state and, and it being associated with an observation. You see that? That's what this means. The conditional part means that. That's the intuition. You know, given tabby, it's an adjective, but it could be a noun. Which one is more likely? Adjective, higher probability. Okay, guys? So now that's where this Bayes theorem comes in is that the X's and the Y's are really represented by these variables. That's, when, that's an important element, the observations versus the states. And then the other thing is that this one is not conditional and this one is conditional. But we made the assumption that's very important in, 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 um, in Bayes is that for, for individual ones, we don't have to say, okay, what's the probability of the given that two words ago it was cat? We can't do that. That's too difficult. It doesn't really work very well either. We don't have, that's called a trigram. We don't have that much in information in the world of tabby cat, the tabby cats, but we have a lot of information about the tab, you know, the individual word. So one of the assumptions here in, in, in a Bayes theorem is that we treat terms in, you know, like this. We don't have to look at trigrams and long sequences, basically. And it still works pretty well or well enough. So anyway, so what do we need here? So now I've kind of motivated that we have this idea of probabilities, right? And we need some conditional and then also some individual terms, okay? that we need to multiply in a sequence. So for every state, we calculate these, keep it, keep track of it. Then the next state, we multiply it again and so on like that, all right? For the whole sequence. Obviously that can be a tough thing to do and highly exponential. So um, there's an algorithm called the Viterbi algorithm that does that really well. And the Viterbi algorithm is a classic implementation of what is called dynamic programming where in dynamic programming, what you do is you solve multiple problems kind of independently and then create like tables of results. And then with those results, you come up with the final result. Okay, guys. So Viterbi is a little bit tricky, but the script is already on, uh, on Brightspace. Okay, so, you, no, sorry, not on Brightspace, on GitHub, and you guys can take a look at it. All right, so now that we have kind of hopefully uh, this framework, let's go ahead and um, get into a little bit more details of it. All right, so, so what do we need? All right, so we've talked about, we have the states, right? So we, we, we establish here, that we have states rainy and sunny. And we're getting, we need to now like fix on these things because that's why this, the, I don't wanna add cloudy. It'll just make it more complicated. So rainy and sunny are the states. That's what we're trying to predict. Okay, guys. So I'm trying to predict this sequence given that sequence, okay? So that's what I'm trying to do. Trying to, given that the observation state, I want to predict this sequence of um, states. Now, what do we need for that? Well, if we're calculating probabilities, right? If we're calculating probabilities, 
we need some way, some information, right? So we're gonna need some information here. And now we're gonna need some new element. We're gonna need actually three tables of probabilities. We need something called the transition probabilities. Okay, so transition probabilities. We need something called the emissions probability. So we need the emission probabilities. And I'll provide you know, with this with data an example. And we actually need something called a start probability. So let's start with the start probability. Why do we need those? Well, intuitively, we have a sequence, right? A sequence of states. And so we have something like this, and the data is accumulating, right? The data is accumulating. So we're saying, you know, we got some probability here, one, and now to this probability two, we need to add P1 so that we can end up with P2. So P2 is like, you know, current P plus P1. Do you see that? And then for this probability over here, let's call it P3. Well, P3 needs, current probability plus P2 because it's the cumulative of the previous ones. You see that? The algorithm will work like that. But what about when you're in the very first node? It's gonna want some probability there. Do you see that? So for it to work out. And so that's usually called, called the starting probability. All right, so we just need to know that. What's the likelihood that the state is in this? The cat, in general, what's the likelihood that it's sleeping? 95%, right? What's the likelihood that the cat is being nice to you? 0.00001%, right? So that's basically the idea. It's just the overall starting state. You see that? So we need to have this accounted for, but we get that from our knowledge of the environment. Now, I'm not going to show you guys how to compute these probabilities. That would be an, an, an entirely different problem. But just be aware, if, if you have a corpus, a data set like ADSB, for instance, the flight, um, you could collect from that the, start, the transition probabilities, the emission probabilities, and the starting probability. For the English language or any other language, again, you go in and you do all the counts of frequencies and everything and you would have all of these. So they, there's a procedure for getting these probabilities by looking at all the data, but that's a different, different thing, okay? So here, we're just gonna assume these. So right now, I'm just describing them. In a second, we'll, we'll add some data to them. So the starting probabilities are basically that. Then we have the transition probabilities, and the transition probabilities just imply that transition between um, rainy and rainy, so what's the likelihood that it's rainy and you're going to go to rainy versus what's the likelihood of being at rainy and going to sunny? Do you see that? Okay, so it's basically the state transitions from state to state. And then we have, so that's transitions. And then we have emission probabilities and the emission are kind of the conditional. What's the likelihood that in, in, in general, if it's raining, you're going to walk? What's the likelihood that if it's raining, in general, you're going to shop. What's the likelihood that if it's sunny, you're going to clean and so on? Do you see that? So you have to collect that information from a corpus. That, that's why I said initially, I want to find this out. I'm going to give all of you a Fitbit or I don't, I don't even know how that works, but some kind of thing like that. And I'm going to have you do this for a year. So think about it. This is what companies like Fitbit or, or other companies, this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to predict what you do so that they can advertise to you that they, so that they can make money off of you. And so what they do is they have you for a year doing this, and then they're going to calculate these transition probabilities, emission probabilities, starting probabilities. And then now they have a model. They get a new client that they've never seen before, but they feel that it falls into some profile. Boom. They get... Um, what they're doing that day, and then they can figure out the weather, obviously for this problem or some other thing for some other problem. Does that make sense, guys? Are there any questions so far? Questions, it seems. All right, so 
Okay, I'm not hearing any questions. So I, I've discussed this in parts, right? So remember, we, you know, hidden Markov models, some state machine, um, and then, right? Sorry. And then we need to calculate these probabilities. This is just Bayes' theorem with, its, with all of its simplifications, which are pretty much the same simplifications actually for naive Bayes. We're literally like discussing naive Bayes as much as HMMs right now. And we know we need these probabilities. We know that instead of a sequence, we can treat them independently just by multiplying each and we don't need the whole the cat is, but the and cat and is. And that seriously simplifies things because if you think about it, you're gonna have really good probabilities for the, you're gonna have really bad probabilities for the cat is. You know, think about a foregram, the black hole gravitated towards, how many times does that four word phrase happen in all of the English language? Not much. Now try to find that in the New York Times. Maybe you will never find it. Do you see that? So if you had the whole language, maybe you would see it a lot. But even Google doesn't have the whole language. The new, if your data set is just a New York Times or Wikipedia, you may never find that four word phrase. Do you understand that? That's really key. Hmm? And even it, that's a good, that's a good point. And do you think you would see a lot of no. the black hole gravitates towards in that? Probably not. But still, even, even still pretty low. And that's, that's the point. That's actually the point I'm trying to make with Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem would say you need the black hole gravitates towards. You see that, but then it doesn't work. So you make the simplifying assumption that instead of doing that, just find the, just find black hole, just find gravitates, just find towards and multiply. You see that that's the underlying thing because that makes your problem a lot simpler. and multiply them, and that works. And that's the simplification with Bayes' theorem that makes this work. Because that the original function, as you can see, is this one, the whole sequence. Okay, and that's why, it, my, my point is finding that data would be very difficult. And so you're, it would be impractical, all your values would be zero. You know, it, every when you multiply zero to small numbers by other small numbers, you know what happens to them, right? They become even smaller and smaller and smaller. Sometimes this is called vanishing gradients. It's a it's a it's a similar idea to vanishing gradients, but at some point they'll become zero, and then you can't do anything. With it. Okay, so that's why this is really important, actually, this simplification. So hopefully that makes sense. And then, so now then. We know that we don't, so notice how I wrote this like this, right? Given, I'm gonna to change to another color. Given a uh, walk, shop, clean, walk, right? The whole sequence, predict the sequence, uh, rain, sunny, sunny, rain. Because ultimately we want this, right? We want that, but we're just gonna simplify it and just multiply them in space. And we, we just look at these individual ones and so on. So no, so then that simplification is really important. So then we can do this processing. And then the, these tables are also very simple because instead of saying, you know, something like sunny, sunny to rainy, sunny, and this is just one entry. Right, so this would just be like that. Imagine finding that information. That probability would be pretty tough. So what we end up doing is the simplification that we really just don't need like that, and we just need individual ones. So it's sunny. We just need, what's the next one? Rainy or sunny? And so on, and we calculate these probabilities. 
And that's the importance of the simplification to base here without getting into the actual. Got it? Okay. All right. So uh, it's 321. So let's take a 10 minute break. I'll close this video and then we'll start a new one with the where we're gonna fill out transitions, emissions, and the starting power. Okay. If we run long today, we still have next uh, next next week. Got it? All right, so let's take a 10 minute break. I will stop this one. <laughs>